Yeah, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our December lunch and learn for CCL. We've got, we're being joined by Breen Murphy of Carbon Collective. Uh, he's a CCL volunteer as well. Uh, so he knows what we're all about and has actually tailored this to us as well. Uh, he's gonna give a uh, presentation about uh, Carbon Collective and green investing. And we're gonna turn over to the floor for any questions you guys might have. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Breen. Uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. It is uh, it is such an honor to be speaking to a group of CCL volunteers because like, I just, I mean, I miss going to the DC conferences. So it's it's really fun to like seeing faces. Like I haven't gotten to see Sabrina in a couple of years. So uh, it's just good to see all the smiling faces. Um, all right, I'm gonna dive right in because I got a couple stories built into this, but um, I wanted to talk today about like how to be a smart investor who cares about climate change. Um, so in, in terms of today, um, we wanted to look at um, a couple things and, and Max's post I'll get into a little bit, but uh, looking back to 1925, like is divesting smart? And then looking ahead, like um, looking at uh, disruption of fossil fuels, accounting for climate risk. Um, then just doing a couple basics on how to be a smart investor. Um, and then looking at the investing landscape, one of the things we wanted to be able to provide is a little bit of the analysis of, um, you know, what we're seeing in ESG and like, um, and some of the conclusions that we came to in building out investment por portfolios that are aligned with solving climate change. So, um, this, this is me in the middle, Citizens Climate Lobby, like, I basically started out my pathway into getting really into, into climate change solutions, um. You know, my grandmother passed away like, oh God, it's like eight years ago now. And she was uh, someone that was really important to me. And when she died, I was like, okay, I've been riding her civic coattails. And I just decided climate change was the biggest issue and it took me a while to find uh, CCL. But this guy who's with Dana Rohrbacher, just like kneeling down at Mark Tabert. If you guys have been to any DC conferences, you've probably run into him. Um, he looped me in and I got really excited and it really helped set a framework, um, learning about cap and trade, fee and dividend, traditional carbon taxes, really understanding this economy and, and what are the climate impacts, like how much better off we'll be. Um, it's been really great, especially because I had a Republican congressman um, who really cared about like the economic side of things. So um, it's, it's been a fun thing that ended up launching like I developed a skill set that would enabled me to take over this role at, at Carbon Collective. So, um, so the very biggest thing is we have uh, a, an investment problem with, with with climate change, and the like. The basic thing is we have all the solutions, all the all the technology, or the majority of them that we need to to help address climate change. Um, in 2017, we had a speaker on uh, one of the Saturday calls. His name was Paul Hawken. Um, I'm not sure if you guys had a chance to listen to that one, but it's a really good one. Um, but the basic thing, he he came out with this book along with like top climate scientists and economists that's that outlined a hundred climate solutions to help us achieve drawdown by 2050. Um, and so basically looked and said like, hey, we have all this stuff today. Um, what is missing is investment in these things. Um, and now there are multiple ways to get this investment. Obviously, uh, at CCL, we're, we're really excited about uh, fee and dividend um, because that puts a price on the pollution, which will shift uh, the investment over into these cleaner sources of energy. Um, but there's also like other ways from the government, like government policy levers are going to be like incredibly impactful. Um, but the other one, if you're looking at large collective will, is, is money. Like money is a way in which you can change this. Um, so we need to get, you know, this is saying three times um, more recently, we, they, there was a study that came out of Project Drawdown, we're big fans of them, um, that said we need a 10X um, the amount of climate solutions investment. Um, so that's really what we're trying to focus after. We have all the solutions, you know, we have a plan, now we need to like invest and fund that plan, um, you know, so that we can execute on it later. So in terms of Carbon Collective, something that we wanted to do is, be climate first, but still leverage all the best principles uh, of investing. Low fees, because fees eat into your, your investment performance. Um, make sure it's diversified um, so that you manage the risk in your portfolio, um, which ends up making it market tracking. We're not trying to beat the market, right? Like, like most investing research is just suggesting um, that, that trying to beat the market is a little bit of a, like a, you know, a fool's errand. 
um, and then trying to see easy and clear impact. So this is this is a, like our performance from um, you know back uh, back the last five years, ending in January first of 2020. So this is this is just before COVID, and so we're looking at this and we're seeing um, okay the performance of the stocks they're uh, you know in our portfolio they're doing really fairly similar, but then something happened. And in the last year since COVID, like things started to radically shift. Um, and so we started to outperform the markets. And this is really the thing that we wanted to better understand about our portfolios. Because as I said, we were trying to build something market tracking. And that's still, it's still our goal, uh, but it helped us understand what is happening in, in climate quite a bit better. So, but I want to start with something that, uh, and this is, this is where Max um, he was bringing up this point about divestment, right? And one of the things that's been happening is you, you've heard of Bill McKibben. Um, you've heard of like the divestment movement out of Harvard, who just got Harvard divide, divest. Um, there's quite a few different organizations that are looking at divesting. So we wanted to give you a historical perspective on that. So <laughs> um, we are going to look at uh, the data on divestment from Jeremy Grantham. Um, he's an incredibly famous investor. He's He's like... Um, not quite Warren Buffett, but he's like in that echelon. If you're in the investment world, like you know, you know and take seriously Jer Jeremy Grath Grantham. Um, and so we're using the data from what he did to evaluate divestment. Um, and the basic thing is over the last, um, you know, down here, it's over the last, you know, uh, almost a hundred years, it's 96 years. Um, you know, divestment has been you know, very close. It's underperformed the market by 0.05%. That's very comparable. I mean, that's a lot of money if you look at it in compounding interest. And this is why investing is incredibly important is this much has it has a difference of $100,000 over 96 years. So that's where we wanted to, to start with. But the thing that starts to change is um, as you start to get in more recent times, um, you know, it becomes more neutralized. Um, and then as you get in the last 10 years, um, you're seeing that um, oil and gas is starting to become a laggard, right? And so this is the energy index from 2011 to August, 2021, um, and it has been down. So it has not been performing uh, along with the markets. Um, so one of the things that, uh, <laughs> and you guys will laugh because I'm sure you guys you know, get a bunch of deniers. I, I come from a, like a, a place that is, has a lot of deniers um, in Orange County, California. And one of the things that I end up saying to people is, is like, this is one of my CCL talking points is, look, I know you don't believe in climate change, but like for, for the health of your investment portfolio, like, please look at how your oil, uh, you know, your oil investments are, have been performing over the last years, um, because they haven't been keeping track with the market this year, they're doing a little bit better, but even this year, like over the last five years, they still haven't broken even you know, with a, a boom year. Um, so, um, and that doesn't even get into coal. Coal is down 99% in the last 10 years. Um, coal, and so you're, you're looking at these fossil fuels as they become less attractive and more of a climate risk, they start to have a portfolio risk as well. So now I wanna look forward really quickly. Um, and I know, I know there's a, like a lot of things going in chat. I'm, I'm going to try to get through, through these things as, as quickly as I can so I can answer questions. Um, and I, I will have a little bit of time to answer them. Um, so the thing that we wanted to, to set the stage for is techn technological disruptions ha happen quickly. So on the left, you have uh, this photo. It's 1900. It's New York. There is one car in New York City. 13 years later, same place. There is one horse and buggy. So in 13 years, we saw a radical transformation uh, uh, of the transportation in the United States. And so one of the things is that we want to do is like look at like, well, what is happening here? And so we're looking at fossil fuels. It is that horse and buggy. It's the new VHS. Um, you know, Blockbuster is gone. We have Netflix. And so um, this is uh, coming out of um, Rethink X, um, they're a, a think tank, and they're basically looking at like how do exponential transitions happen. And this, for me, um, is one of the most exciting things about how we are likely to solve climate change. 
um, you're looking here, right? So at the old system, they start to have less less social um, uh, less social license, like less positive uh, branding, um, less government support, less investment, lower margins, lower revenue, higher costs, less public accept acceptance, reverse economies of sale, right? And this basically means it's more and more expensive to extract um, uh, fuel out of the ground. And that's already starting to happen. Like it's much more, it's getting much more expensive to extract fuels out of the ground. Um, and on the flip side, you have like the virtuous cycles is more government support. Um, this is where like fee and dividend could play a huge role, uh, more investment, uh, higher margins, higher revenues, lower costs, kind of, kind of, uh, it seems a little bit backwards, more public acceptance, better capable and public acceptance. You're seeing this with like solar where you have, um, you know, you have Nebraska just set like a hundred percent clean energy standard. This is like a, like a classically Republican area. Um, and like, that's a large amount of acceptance. So you're seeing, like, we're actually seeing these cycles happen. Um, and then economies of scale, more variety. So, um, this, this is just giving you a, a sense of where we are from uh, fuel use now. Um, so you're seeing, uh, you know, the majority of emissions are in transportation and electricity. Um, and this is really good because when you get into investing as we're currently in, a lot of the climate solutions are dealing with these two things. Um, so that's, that's something that's really exciting for me. Um, and you're looking at like quadrillions of British thermal units or BTUs and like, like where, where they are. Um, so in transportation, uh, we're looking at EVs being better and cheaper. Um, and so like when you're looking at this sector of transportation, you're seeing uh, electric cars, they're, they're starting to perform a lot better. Um, a big reason of this, um, and this gets to like Max's uh, point where he was talking about like these big institutes like BlackRock are coming in. That's kind of like the equivalent of like GM or Ford. Like they launched the Honda Insight, um, you know, like they launched these electric cars that no one wanted to buy, right? It took a Tesla to, to honestly create um, something that people would want to buy. And now we're seeing, you know, the Rivians of the world, we're seeing more of this other part, they're starting to invest in this next stage of, of electric transport. And electric cars are better. I have an electric car. I haven't had to take it into the dealership in three years. Um, they cost the same um, over their lifetime, a little more expensive up front, but they have a lot lower maintenance fees. Um, and they'll soon reach cost parity at the dealership, meaning like buying them at the dealership will be the same. So that's something that's really exciting. So we're, we're seeing these zero emission vehicles are starting to become incredibly competitive. And there was just some research talking about the adoption is actually much faster than people think it came out a couple of days ago. Um, so it, it's on the exponential growth. So here you, you have like the amount of towing capacity, even from, uh, you know, an electric truck. Um, and one of the things that we look at is, uh, you know, uh, ice engines, internal combustion engines, they have like 20,000 parts in them, whereas an electric engine has 20. And so they're just more efficient, they work better, they have more torque. Um, and so the, like there's a pathway for it to get better. Um, this is it looking at the lifetime costs. Um, you can see the electric cars are, are down here and cost per month is just like, it's really pretty incredible and they're a lot lower emissions. Um, this is us getting into electric cars being cheaper to buy. And this is showing. So this has been, this is an old chart. It's even better than this now. Um, there was just new research that's showing that, that there's like a hockey stick where it's starting to go in 21, like even higher. So that was one mega trend, right? Like electric vehicles, two, renewables and batteries. Um, it's cheaper and growing exponentially, both these sectors to combine. Um, so when we're looking at electricity, 28% of all U.S. fossil fuel use is from electricity, um, or it comes from electricity. 61% uh, of electricity comes from fossil fuels. Um, and on 2030, to be under the path of staying, uh, to, you know, hitting 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, uh, we, we have to drop 25%. So, and that looks like it's starting to happen, right? So fossil fuel plants, are being used far less than projected. Um, and this is, th this is one of the things that I think is um, 
like pretty interesting is you're looking at an 85 or 90 percent a util, util, utilization rate is what they're estimating, um, but they're actually only being utilized at about 55 percent, right? And so one of the big reasons is it is more expensive to just like operate a conventional fossil fuel power plant um, than it is to build and operate a solar or wind power plant. Like that's how competitive these industries are. And you're seeing in the United States that there's there's more and more uh, of, the, of these power plants are becoming renewable energies. So this is that exponential growth again. So this is, this is solar and wind. And what we're seeing is that solar and wind have the economic tailwinds, right? So if you look at like the EU, um, I mean, we talk a lot on these calls about the, the border uh, adjustment tax that they're having that we're trying to use to pass the, the carbon fee and dividend. Um, so that's going to be a really big headwind for fossil fuels, and which also acts as a tailwind for renewables. So we have this pathway to have like a more virtuous flywheel. Um, and then the last thing is just a warmer planet is bad for business. Um, and so it's less predictable crop yields, uh, less nutritional um, uh, food, more damage to infrastructure, uh, rising insurance costs, uh, less predictable real estate market. Uh, more GDP spent on disaster relief. This is like the flood insurance programs, uh, more lawsuits, more greater, uh, or more political instability. You can see that in Afghanistan, which has had, you know, like a, uh, like a record 900 year drought go through it, which destabilized the farming um, and created an opportunity. And the Taliban issue is already there, but it definitely created an opportunity. So when we look at avoiding catastrophic, um, uh, global warming, like this is how much we need to decrease our use of oil, coal, and natural gas, 75, um, 90, and 55%. So um, and when the pain is bad enough, uh, legislation will come. Um, this is what gets me so excited about everything that's going on at CCL. Like, I, like it just feels like we're, we're so close. Um, so if something like this were, were to pass, it will just continue to increase the incentives to uh, reduce your fossil fuel use. And especially when you have these large uh, fossil fuel emitters um, will be impacted, they'll be able to switch more quickly. So they're being out competed in transportation, they're being out competed in electricity, and they're soon to be out competed in the remaining sectors. And that's what makes us excited about the way we've constructed our portfolio. So I'm gonna take a quick break and go into how to be a smart investor. And this informs how we've built our portfolios. Um, so active versus passive investing. Basically, the people who are trying to beat the market, they're on a little bit of a fool's errand. There's this famous bet between Warren Buffett, like the most famous investor, and this large head fund um, you know, investor, his name is Ted Saides, on who, like, could the hedge funds beat, beat the, just the S&P 500? They have big fees. Uh, and he's like, no, we're really smart. We can do this. You know, Warren Buffett wins at five years. He wins at 10 years. Um, and so the, this, this bet has been going on. And what we're seeing is like this diversified portfolio is the thing that works the best um, for, the, for people most of the time. Um, so, and it's largely because uh, there are higher fees associated with active investing um, and there's concentrated risk. So you can have like volatility. Passive investing, we're not trying to pick um, like winners and losers, we're investing in the total market and we're trying to have low fees so things don't eat into uh, your returns. Um, another thing here, and this is based on some um, you know, Nobel Prize winning uh, economic research. Um, his name is Henry Markowitz. Um, and it's looking at like, how do you reduce the risk in your portfolio while still getting a good return? And one of the things, this one always kills me, is most people think of uh, the lowest risk being like 100% bonds, but it's actually not the truth. You know, it, you like 25% stocks with your bonds, that's because they have different types of risk, actually reduces the risk of your portfolio while getting you more return. And so we have, you know, we're looking at creating like a, a diversified portfolio um, that includes stocks and bonds, uh, regardless of, uh, with different allocations, depending on what your goals are. And then there's rebalancing. So this one, um, when you invest, your investments do not perform the same. And so there's a process of 
buying, you know, buying shares uh, that have not performed as well um, and selling shares that have performed well to make that allocation match again. Um, and that sounds counterintuitive, but here you'll see um, like the, the importance of, of rebalancing. So um, you're, you're going to see a better return when you, when you rebalance. And that's what this, this arc is, is the rebalance line. Um, okay. And so this is, this gets into Max's piece. It's like why investing matters. Um, so cost of capital, the better, uh, your stock is doing, the lower the cost of capital you can get. And so plug power was able to raise a uh, billion dollars for us green hydrogen, not blue hydrogen, um, to help build it out because th their stock was doing well. Um, voting. Um, voting is, is one of the most important things to actually cause change and because it is policy, right? It's not, um, it's not a public commitment that gets ignored. It, it is policy. Um, and so you're seeing um, ExxonMobil actually had a really interesting turn of events when shareholders voted to put two pro-climate people on its board. And these board are the people that are, are influencing um, you know, the decisions that are being made at a policy level for that company. Uh, so narrative, right? Being able to tell this story is really important. So if, like the more we talk about how poorly performing oil and gas is, um, the be like the worse it performs. And so it becomes less attractive to invest, you know, and, and a good example of this that I think about is even earlier markets, right? Like people starting companies, um, you're not seeing like the large venture capital companies investing in as much, um, you know, technology to, for fossil fuel extraction. Like, you know, most of what the big money is being made out of is like software. And there's a big climate tech, uh, surge right now. Um, and, because people are seeing that climate is a huge opportunity to improve the lives of people and, and build uh, sustainable businesses around. So again, that comes back to closing the gap, right? This is like really our, like a core piece of our mission. Like we're, we're built to help solve climate change. And the reason why is because we need to drastically increase the amount of investment in clean energy. So I, I want to do like a little tour of the climate investment landscape, because one of the things that Max talked about is uh, he referenced um, this very famous um, sustainability investor. His name is Tariq Fancy. He came out of BlackRock um, and BlackRock talks a really big game around uh, around climate, um, but they often fall short. And Tariq Fancy quit his job because like, hey, this is all this is all BS. Right. It, it's essentially what he said. Um, so we wanted to give you a little bit of the lay of the land. And what we look at is like high impact funds mixed with uh, like compared to negative impact and then with high concentrated fees and then diversified low fees. And what we've been seeing is some of the places that have created like more interesting, um, you know, ETFs. Uh, a good example is First Trust has this one, it's called QClean. It's invested in a lot of renewable um, technologies. Um, it, it's, it tends to be a little bit higher fee, um, you know, and then down here, it's like aspiration, like at one point, like one of their largest holdings was like the company that makes solo cups. So it's like, they're not really doing much for impact. And like, they had relatively high fees too. Um, the low fee places, um, and we'll do a little spotlight on Betterment's climate impact portfolio. Um, it, it's like almost the same thing as what you're doing. So Vanguard is a little closer, uh, but it's like less, it's all in this like less bad area and not actively good. So, um, so in green funds, so you guys heard me talk about First Trust, um, the Clean Energy Index Fund, um, iShares Clean Energy. So the thing that we really like about these um, is they are structured into clean energy, but they don't encompass all the climate solutions um, that are out there. So if you look at Project Drawdown, yes, they're looking at wind, solar, but they're looking at like, uh, refrigerants, they're looking at energy efficiency, they're looking at, um, you know, heat pumps, you know, they're looking at, um, like, women's education and reproductive rights is a climate solution, actually. Um, not that they're forced to have fewer kids, but when they have access to them, it tends to be a, a stabilizer for economies, and they tend to have fewer kids. Um, so it's just giving people access. So there's things like that, um, that they don't have in terms of climate impact. Um, in terms of uh, performance in your portfolio, they tend to be very concentrated. 
So this is why we highlight um, the, the percent of total market. They have a small sliver of the total market, which increases the risk of your portfolio going up, up and down. And they're even concentrated inside sectors as well. Um, and they tend to be just a little bit more expensive than, than you would like. This, this, this cost to them erodes your performance a little bit. Um, they're not bad, but it's a little bit more than you would expect. Um, climate funds. So these are, um, there's like ETFs, Etho Capital. This is the one that I used uh, before I got to um, Carbon Collective. Um, and the thing it's, you see it has like a higher percent of total market. Um, still not a great expense ratio. Um, it has a positive to neutral impact. Um, they, they invest in uh, the lowest emitting uh, uh, companies in, across all the sectors. Um, and then you have like Aspiration, which is probably the most famous, but again, I was talking about the, their holdings are not particularly uh, good and they have slightly higher fees. Um, ESG and voting funds. Um, the one that I think is the most interesting is engine number one led the charge to like get uh, pro climate people on Exxon's board. So we're huge fans of theirs. Um, we disagree with their theory of change, um, which is getting uh, fossil fuel companies to reinvent their business. Um, and, and I'll get more into that. So uh, I want to do a highlight on Betterment's climate impact portfolio. This is this is Betterment's portfolio um, as of a couple months ago. Um, so there could be some changes. Um, but when we're looking at it, a lot of those things that I just showed you are all showing up here. And we're going to do like a little bit of a dive in here. So uh, one of the things that we like to use is uh, fossilfreefunds.org. Uh, when you're evaluating any of your funds, like everybody who invests, if you have access, it's created by this Berkeley nonprofit called As You Sow. Um, we vote in coalition with them. So we're big fans of As You Sow, um, but they are trying to increase the amount of transparency inside of investing. Um, and so they're showing, you know, the, the, S, the SPYX, uh, the fossil fuel reserves free, it still has some oil and gas in it. Like Berkshire Hathaway has a bunch of coal, it has a bunch of railway, it has a bunch of uh, utilities, as Duke Energy, right? Like these are high emitting companies. So when you look at like how good they are, it's not that much impact. Uh, iShares ESG. Um, so when you're looking at, uh, do you guys remember back in the fall, there was like the big fireball in the Gulf of Mexico? Um, so uh, Betterment, uh, you know, their debt, they held bonds, that is the debt of a company that created that fireball. Um, green bonds is one of the most problematic areas that we see in green investing um, for a handful of reasons, um, largely because um, one, it's a much less transparent market. Uh, so it's harder to follow. Like it just is like you still need a, a version of like the the person on the floor buying your shares there it's like a there's a lot less access to that market and, and it's a lot more opaque um, but also the the way people have categorized debt um, you can raise money for uh, a bond initiative and um, you don't have to use it for that green initiative you know a lot of times it can go into a general fund also uh, a lot of the places that hold these um, pieces of debt they're big, and this is an example of it, they're big fossil fuel dependent companies, Qatar, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Russia, right? Like these are huge fossil fuel emitters, Brazil. Um, and so that, that's the kind of thing that we start to see in emerging market bonds. Um, so when you look at Betterment's portfolio, um, when you look at compared to the average emissions in their portfolio, um, an S&P 500 index fund would have uh, 65 tons of CO2 for every million dollars invested. They only have 57.6 tons. So it's like slightly better, um, but it's not radically better. And so we have uh, quite a bit less, right? We, we're reducing about 85%. And then when you compare their fees, like this is where we're trying, again, going back to the smart investor, we're trying to have like very competitive fees like lowering the bar so people have access to investing with us. Um, again, so getting back to that climate friendly landscape, there's a huge gap, right? And so when Max is talking about like the problems, he was saying divestment doesn't have um, you know, that much behind it saying it works. 
And, and that's true. It's not just divesting. That's one of the problems with ESG funds. It's also actively investing in the solutions and shareholder advocacy. So the one part of the stool that he talks about is kind of in the investing with your values. Um, it's like, I'm not going to invest in, you know, a tobacco company, but you're also not investing in, uh, you know, public health, right? And so that's the way we think of it. You know, we don't want to invest in fossil fuel companies, but we also want to invest in creating this more beautiful world. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little about the conclusions that we came to in building the portfolios we have. Um, and this gets, I'm so glad that Max talked about theory of change. Um, ethical pressure on, co on companies can work. Um, so, so an example, uh, following George Floyd's murder, U.S. companies pledged $50 billion towards racial equity, right? However, if you don't have a seat at the table, it's just words. So all that $50 billion that was pledged towards racial equity, um, only $250 million has been spent or devoted. So that's only 0.5%. And this is where shareholder advocacy really comes in and telling the story. Um, Companies don't want to kill their golden goose. This is the reason why we disagree with the theory of change of engine number one. This is the group that got uh, pro-climate people on the board of Exxon and Chevron. Um, we're huge fans of them for doing that and being able to do that. But we don't believe that a fossil fuel company is actually going to honestly 100% reinvent itself. Um, and so we think it's easier to do it another way. We think the easier way to do it is going up to the people who aren't dependent on fossil fuels and getting them to change, right? And this is like Amazon, like Coca-Cola. Um, you know, if they're in, they're in what we call our low carbon portfolio, and I'll get to that. But like these people are going to be more likely to switch to renewable energy because their core business isn't reliant upon um, fossil fuels, right? It's it's reliant upon it now, but it's not a core piece of their business. So we want to own and pressure the largest brands, reduce fossil fuel demand, and change the narrative. And that's why that when we're talking about our portfolios like, like performing better, we want to highlight these mega trends so people get excited about investing in this way. This is part of that narrative. Um, okay, so breaking down, we want to, so this is a carbon collective portfolio bold. This is a core portfolio. We have two types. We have, if you're, you know, on the, on the pure side, you just want to invest in climate um, impact. Um, we have our climate index, which is this, this percent right here, um, mixed with green bonds. Um, and so, but we hold the low carbon economy, you know, those Coca-Colas, that groups of people um, for a very specific purpose, which is for shareholder advocacy. Um, also uh, for people who um, need that additional uh, uh, diversification, to reduce the amount, their portfolio goes up, up and down, and that's called volatility. So um, when we're looking at creating this portfolio, and this is our broader one, 85% um, of emissions come from four sectors of the 11 sectors in the investment economy, utilities, materials, energy, and industrials. Um, and you're seeing utilities being the biggest one and not even energy, which is really kind of inter interesting. Um, and so we just cut those out, gone. They're, they're, they're gone. And the thing that's interesting is they're only 19% of the stock market. So we're retaining 81% of our diversification by doing that. And so that, that means we're having 80% of the market, 1400 stocks, and they can, all this whole group can sell their products with hundred percent clean energy. Um, you know, no dirty utilities, no oil companies, no fracking companies, no raw steel manufacturers, petrochemical, uh, weapons manufacturers, airlines, all that, all gone. Um, and then, so we start to clean up the low carbon sectors. Um, we do meat processing and tobacco companies are pulled out. Um, we also pull out big banks and Berkshire Hathaway. Um, big banks are the largest financiers of fossil fuel companies. Um, and so we do not want to support them continuing to do what they've been doing. Um, and then we reinvest in the companies building climate solutions. So divest, then reinvest. And that's what we call our climate index. Um, our, we're really excited. We just launched our 2022 climate index. Um, it was in Bloomberg, um, but it's 169 companies that are solving climate change. Um, they're like their core business is solving climate change. Um, it, like I can give links to this. It's, it's a really, um, amazing page. We show every company that we evaluated as well as every company that went into the index, um, and why, 
Um, so it's like a level of transparency that not most people don't have access to. And each company in that has an article on it on like why it's in there, you know, what it can do better. Um, because like even the Teslas of the world that are like completely reimagining, you know, transportation, there's still a lot of things that we can do better. Um, so we're super excited about the types of companies in here. Um, you know, again, these are project drawdown solutions, uh, green utilities, yield codes, grid expansion, building automation, solar, electric cars, fuel cells, insulation, wind, batteries, LEDs, smart performance, landfill, methane capture, industrial recycling, water efficiency. You know, like there's a ton of solutions. Um, you know, there's also one that has sponsored fee and dividend in here, which is uh, uh, Hannon Armstrong. Um, and Sabrina, I think it's in your area. I think they're like a Baltimore, Maryland company. Um, but one of the things that I love is they have a subset of their company that is doing like coastal wetlands restoration. Um, and I, I just, that's one that's always stuck out to me. So, and then we, for, you know, going back to being a smart investor and making sure there's diversification with bonds, we, we mix both green and government bonds. Um, we really wanted to include corporate bonds in here, but at this moment, um, there's no good products that allow us to put corporate bonds in that don't have a significant, significant fossil fuel uh, footprint. Um, and it's largely for the things that I mentioned before, which is there's not a lot of transparency. Um, a company or, or a country can get debt um, and not use it, it like for a, an initiative and maybe use it for something else. And so you, you might be funding um, you know, that fireball in the Gulf. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, yeah, so, so we end up holding green bonds and US treasuries um, as, a, as a result. Um, and a lot of our green bonds are international. Let's see here. So in summation, like it's diverse, 1500 stocks. It's inexpensive, uh, historically market tracking. Um, we're doing a little bit better um, as a result of our, our climate index has actually outperformed since inception. Um, and and our, like the summary is like investments, it's like one of those collective will things. It can be a powerful tool of change. We need more people to continue to do this. Um, looking back divestment, uh, is, is a financially neutral strategy. Looking forward, it's likely to be smart. If you're investing in, in solving climate change and they're exponentially growing, it's probably gonna be a good idea. Um, it's hard to find smart climate framing ways to invest in the, in the markets right now. And so we're trying to collectivize the power of investments by making client investing uh, smart investing. Um, so that is, um, Oh, that's, that was uh, just highlighting a lot of people roll over 401ks with us because um, there's a, another small problem, which is a lot of people have their old employers and they have 401ks there and there's higher fees and a lot of them don't get their assets. So there's like a stranded 401k problem. So we see a lot of people with that and we're, we're really good at helping people like do the calls and all that. So that that is like the summary. The disclaimer is, Past performance is no guarantee of future returns. Um, you know, we're, we're still in this nascent stage, so we're gonna be wanting to show greater impact. Um, and now, uh, questions. I see I got 14, so. Um, oh, Sabrina was talking about Hannah Ar Armstrong has lobbied. Um, ben Ballard. Uh, does the percent of total market refer to the number of companies held in the fund compared to all the companies in the market, such as it's all the companies in the S&P 500. Um, okay, so Sabrina, uh, SPXTR, uh, that was a like an index fund. Uh, uh, ba, 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 ba. All right, Paul Hawkins. Yeah, he's great, by the way. I just saw him speak. He was really fantastic. Okay, are there any other questions you guys have? Feel free to unmute, unmute yourself, type something in the chat. Um, oh, Sarah Joseph, you asked, is there a link? Um, yeah, I, here, let me, let me stop sharing my screen. Let me go get this. It's in community, just as a heads up. So uh, that is it. Um, 
And that link is to a group leader form. So if you can't access to, to it, we can show you, I can send an email later to you guys on what the gist of it was. Yeah. So the, the basic thing that he says is newer research also indicates that expressing socially de desirable, desirable preferences through holding voting shares can be more effective than divestment. And so again, he's talking about the problems with the divestment. Of the things we do, we divest, invest, and advocate. Uh, divesting is, is the least impactful, just being super honest with things. And that is what the majority of the financial services world is doing. So um, we divest and reinvest and advocate. Okay. Uh, okay, how would you recommend someone get started with Carbon Collective? Um, here, look, I'll just drop you guys a link in the chat. Um, it is really easy to get, get signed up with us. Uh, the one thing I'll say is um, we create your accounts on the back end. And so there's like a form to go through. Um, a couple things to think about before you go through the form is, you know, what type of account do you want? Um, so if you're rolling over an old 401k, you'll probably want to create an IRA. Um, if you're rolling over like a current Roth IRA and you want to transition it over, um, you know, thinking through which ones of those Roths um, are ones where you can, uh, your money grows tax-free and you can pull it out tax-free after 59 and a half, but you include your money uh, before taxes uh, or after taxes. And then your IRAs are usually if you have, um, you know, higher income now and you want to reduce your tax uh, your taxes now, and then you have to take out capital gains at the end. Um, oh, Daniela. Okay. That's a really good one. Um, explaining the basics of why divestment is not effective at influencing how clean the market is. Um, oh, the, like, have you ever heard the expression that like silence benefits the oppressor and not the oppressed? Um, that's essentially in like in as short and succinct a way as possible. That is why divestment doesn't help because it's just not doing something. It's not actively advocating for a different way or a better way. Um, it's not investing in a new way. It's not advocating for a new way. And so divestment really doesn't have um, that much of a track record. There's some people that are trying to advocate uh, that the narrative around divestment is really impactful. Um, so just talking about how important it is to divest is really good. And that's, that's a form of advocacy in some ways, um, but just divesting in and of itself um, doesn't seem to have like a lot of research behind it. There's a really good um, research paper um, by Giving Green. Um, I could probably drop a link into the chat for that. Um, but um, Giving Green, they're organized by like, if I weren't in CCL, um, another group I really like is called the Effective Altruists. Um, and uh, they have a spinoff group, uh, ESG Impact. Um, they have a spinoff group that is called Giving Green. Um, and oh, I might have to like follow up with you guys on this one. Uh, let me try over here. Yeah, so, so Breen, that was planning to send an email. So if you have any additional links. Go okay, I'll send I'll send you guys the Giving Green uh, link, um, but that's a great question, Daniela. Um, I I'm so so excited that you asked that. Um, any others? Like uh, this is something that I'm really excited to talk about. So like, um, you know, and, and the, the the one thing I would also say is like the work that you're doing at CCL and that we're doing at CCL, I still believe is like more impactful. Like actively at, like advocating for government policy, I think is going to have a larger influence. But money, I think, is like a good, you know, secondary position in radically changing um, our pathway to helping solving climate change. All right, anything else? No. And people can feel free to unmute themselves as well to uh, say what their questions are. Uh, yeah, Jean. So in a nutshell, Carbon Collective is a financial robo-advisor that aims to close the gap in investments needed, needed in companies that are trying to combat climate change and or at least do no harm and does so with more transparency, low fees and competitive returns. Yeah, yes. Um, and we're, ju we're just beginning. So we just finished a fundraise. Um, you know, we are a venture-backed company. Um, 
And there is a lot of optimism on what we're doing. And what we're going to try to be doing is adding uh, products and services over time so that we can systematically try to leverage more money to help solve climate change. We, ha we have that on our theory of change um, page on our website. So like, I I'm happy to, to, to share that as well. Cool, let's see here. Let's do a gallery and see what's going on. What about, I don't know, Elizabeth Dow, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions right now. Thank you. Um, I am really looking forward to checking out the website. I need to, you know, process a little bit more, but it was really interesting and timely. So <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, okay. Sabrina, you asked, uh, do you want to explain the different levels of risk options you can take for investing? Um, yeah. So our riskiest portfolio is 90% stocks and 10% bonds. And our least risky portfolio um, is 75% uh, bonds and 25% uh, stocks, right? Again, showing you like where the actual technical least, least risky position can be. Um, so that's what we have. Um, we tend to see that uh, risk it, oftentimes is looking at like, what are your goals? If you have something short term, like if you're, there's this really good research paper to looking at like when should you be most and least risky. So it's like if you're within five years of retirement, you should probably have a more neutral uh, strategy. You know, so um, looking at like a 50-50 or 60-40 portfolio, um, you know, being like 50% stocks, 50% bonds. Um, but actually, as you age and get past the five years, once you like, you know, are in a place where you, you may have enough and there's fewer years, um, you can start to slightly increase the risk. Um, other people, if they're younger, if they're saving for a house, um, this is where we say like definitely lower risk, um, you know, and, you know, if you're saving for a house, like investing um, may not even be the right option, right? Like that, that might be a place where like a high yield savings account or something like that is, is probably better. Um, so, um, but, but there are, but there's like a, like, you know, arguments to be made for, for any of that. So we have it all across the spectrum. We have it for both climate only and uh, climate and the low carbon economy. So the low carbon economy has a lot uh, less risk uh, in that. Um, so it reduces the stand standard deviation um, by like, I think it's like three, uh, three points, which just means like three percentage points during a, um, a historically large two standard de deviation event, which just means it won't go down as much. Um, so, uh, but the returns have been um, historically better in the climate index. So, but with more volatility, like, uh, cool. Any, anybody else? So a lot of people's investments are done through uh, their job or stuff. Is there anything they can do to try to encourage their work to uh, change how their 401k is handled or anything like that they would recommend to people? Yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so one of the things that I would say is, uh, fossilfreefunds.org is one of the best places to evaluate what funds are in your portfolio. Cause you, oftentimes you don't get a choice, uh, on what is actually in your 401k. So, so fossil free funds is one. Um, the second thing I would say is like, talk to HR to ask for, uh, like more, uh, climate friendly options. Um, you know, so they're like different, uh, different. 401k companies have different things. Like if you have questions, like you can just ask me, like I'll, I'll just look at the, like whatever's in your 401k, um, whatever, whatever's in 401k too. Um, and then the other thing is for companies that have fewer than 300 people, um, we actually have a, a business 401k plan. Again, low fee, all that stuff, but we have the ability to implement a 401k for your business. Um, so that, that is something that I can, I can share as well. Cool. A a anybody else? Like I'm like, I'm so jazzed to talk about this. I love being around like all of us CCL volunteers. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's an exciting time. I always get like all, like I, I happen to know Danny uh, Richter a little bit. And so I know him to be like, like uh, very skeptical about passing fee and dividend. And so 
uh, with him showing a little bit of optimism on yesterday, Saturday's call, it was fun to see him. Get, oh, Rose, you're, you have a question. Uh, yes. So I will reveal my financial ignorance here. I do not know a lot about financial stuff. My husband mostly handles that and he does dabble in the stock market. Mm -hmm. um, I have talked to him about divesting and reinvesting my mm -hmm. IRA. Mm -hmm. And um, he's said uh, it's currently with Vanguard, which I would mm -hmm. really like to get rid of. And he mm -hmm. said basically that unless I reinvest in a different Vanguard portfolio, I will have to pay big penalties for leaving Vanguard. Um, so how do I handle something like that? So your Vanguard, is it through your employer or is it through you personally? It's personally. Okay. So... Um, and are they retirement accounts or are they uh, like brokerage or trust accounts? Uh, I believe it's a retirement account. Okay. So, um, so if they're personal retirement accounts, um, the, the, the truth is um, our fees are similar. It, are you getting any financial advice too, or are you not getting financial advice? I don't think so. But like I said, I'm not managing okay. it. My husband does. Okay. So we have, uh, so what I'd say is, uh, your husband is most likely right in most circumstances. Vanguard has a history of doing amazing work at reducing fees so that people pay a lot less. So there, there's someone we're really big fans of, and we basically want to become the Vanguard, uh, that is ethical right? Like that, that's what we want to do. So um, the longer answer is in our instances, our, our fund fees are likely to be probably slightly more, but minimally so. Um, there is an advisory fee, which is a little bit more, and that puts us into like 30, um, you know, uh, 35 basis points, which is like 0.35% um, in, in a management fee. And that probably is more than you're paying at Vanguard. Um, but you won't get hit with any taxes, you won't get hit with any uh, penalties, like he's saying, because you're in a retirement account, um, and you're not you're not pulling it out of that. You're just transferring it. So, um, that that would be what I would say there. All right, Jean. Hi, this is Jeannie. Hey, Jeannie. So sorry, I'm I'm kind of the outsider on this call. Yeah. Um, but full full disclosure, I'm. I'm a small investor in Carbon Collective now. Awesome. And, and I, um, I'm, so I'm still learning. Yeah. And listened to a couple of videos or webinars that Zach has prepared. Mm -hmm. He's one of the co-founders. Mm -hmm. and, and I just want to say that I'm, I'm really excited to, as I learn more mm -hmm. about um, the company's mission. Mm -hmm. It gives me an opportunity to put some money behind my values mm -hmm. um, and invest yeah. in things that I believe in. And so mm -hmm. full disclosure, like it's kind of tricky to start putting money in something that you don't know a lot about. But totally. I, will, I will say that as I, as I so I've started small, mm -hmm. um, but as I learn more and I get more confidence in where you guys are headed, Mm -hmm. I feel like it's okay. It's safe to put more in. Mm -hmm. So starting slowly, but um, like I said, as, I, as I'm learning, I'm getting, getting more confidence. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so, so there's a, I'm, I'm going to tie what you're saying uh, to a, 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 a question with Brandon Levy um, you know, in the comments. So, you're right. It is really hard to trust people. The financial industry has made it incredibly complex um, to understand what is going on. And it, even our educational system hasn't done very well to prepare people to have like a baseline financial acumen. So there's a true gap in, in what we're given. Um, so I totally understand that. Um, in terms of safety, like um, the worst case scenario, like, like with investing and with us, let, let's say in a horrible thing, which we don't plan on and we don't see right now, um, but we go out of business, all your money is still there in accounts on um, like much larger custodians. Um, and so that is all there. So I like, I want to make sure people understand like nothing would happen there. 
And then Brandon Levy, um, you're talking about uh, what are the risks of investing via carbon collective versus in the traditional way, like index funds. And the thing that I would say is we're leveraging index, like the index fund thinking applied to solving climate change. Um, that is our goal. We want to take all the best practices, all the best principles for investing and invest to solve climate change. And so the way that is most similar is that climate, uh, climate index and low carbon economy portfolio. Um, we call it the core portfolio because it has that broad, um, you know, it has that broad access to the markets. Investing in the climate index doesn't cost anything extra. It's just like we have our management fee. Um, we do have additional fund fees. They're typically 25 per, uh, a, a quarter uh, of a percent for management fees and it's 10, like 10% or a 10th of a percent um, for fund fees, which is very little. Um, it, but we don't charge on our climate index because they're all individual stocks that we put in the portfolios. So, um, so what I'd say is like the normal things you would think about from like your actual investment portfolio, it's going to be very comparable. That's what we say when we say market tracking is we're designing it to be similar to index investing. Um, okay. I saw more hands. Ben, you had it. You had a hand up. I was just curious. Vanguard has a whole slew of different funds. Yeah. Why wouldn't they just create a fund like this and have it within their, their choice of menu options and put you out of business? Oh, that's such a good, that's such a good question. Um, and so what we see is, uh, we call it this, the innovator's dilemma, right? Which uh, to do what we do, they would have to recreate what we have and then leverage it to, um, to, to like enact that change, right? And that would mean that every other thing that they are holding is wrong. And so they have too much financial risk in creating something like us. This is why the Honda Insight came from major like car manufacturers and they didn't create the Tesla. Like it fundamentally needs a new like new group of people to reimagine this. And what I imagine will happen is that Vanguard will start to be pulled along the same way that GM and Ford are. So you're saying they just aren't culturally capable of thinking that way. And from like a revenue standpoint, like they have too much revenue on the line to shift right now. But if it was just one more option that they made available, it doesn't seem like it would change their whole culture that much. I don't know. Sure, sure. But they are unlikely to make it part of the the, the vision, right? They're, they're unlikely to leverage it in the shareholder advocacy. Um, I hope that changes. Like, And if they do, like, I'm so happy, right? Because won, that means- basically. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In, like, in the big, yeah, because on the bigger picture, like we're trying to leverage, how do we get like, finances to solve that. So if they do it, I mean, they're, they're like one of the two or three largest asset holders in the world. I mean, they have like T trillions of dollars under management. And so if they were to start to vote in the same way that we're voting, like across all their portfolios, it would be such a huge shift. And I hope they do. Well, even if they did one that was like that and made it an option. Oh, it'd be great. Uh -huh. It'd be great. Yeah. Um, great question though. So I know we're getting to the end of the hour, but Ben, I actually called Vanguard to ask a sort of a similar question. And they were very honest that they really don't have the option that I wanted. And this was a few years back. So, I mean, I appreciate the honesty and I have Vanguard accounts as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they yeah. And so the only way I see it is that you just start a new account. I hate to have another account, but that's what I ended up doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, with Carbon Collective. Cool. Ben, did you have your hand raised again or? No, sorry. I just, can I, yeah, do I have please. to put it down actively. Is that what I have to do? Sorry. <laughs> oh. oh, we got and it. Other ones that I've been on, they put it down for me after my question. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> oh, no worries. I probably should have done that. That was probably on me. Um, yeah. Um, Look, I'll I'll put a I'll put my email in a follow up. But like seriously, like I love talking about this. I love thinking about this. Um, you know, um, I love, you know. So I'm happy to help, right? Even if it's not directly, um, you know, with me. Like if you're look, and you know, we have our our founders look at portfolios all the time. What I'd say is the thing that I love is I have all my liquid investments with Carbon Collective. It's something that like I rolled over my old 401k for my old employer. I had my brokerage account kind of you know, mix them together. So I'm like, I'm in on this. Um, 
And it just like, it's my like little life hack because it just all simplified in one place. Um, you know, if you're looking for alternative investments at this point, we're not there yet. Um, that's like real estate, um, you know, crypto, venture capital, private equity. Like we aren't there, but for most people, like that's not a necessary part of their portfolio. Um, that's a nice to have. So I just want to be like pretty straightforward with, with, with where we're at. Well, this is the top of the hour. So I just want to say uh, thank you, Brian. I know a lot of people probably have to get back to work and stuff. Uh, we will be following up uh, with an email with some of the information Breen talked about, as well as the link in the chats and everything, and even the video, uh, if you want to go back and view it later. Yeah. So just thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thanks again, Breen. I just, everyone will give them a round of applause or... <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Breen. Oh, you guys are so welcome. Thank you. Like, I'm so excited you're all volunteering. Um, like, you know, if you run into any climate deniers in your meetings, just warn them about, uh, like, holding oil and gas in their portfolio. I'm